All right, good. Hello, I'm Bruce Shaney, and today in Homemade Science, we're going to take a look at throwing curveballs. Now, some of these pieces are so easy, I guarantee it'll have you throwing a curveball with your very first throw. That was good. Now, the idea of these pieces is that it's acting as an extension of the arm, which means it's going to throw the ball faster than I could by hand. And at the same time that I'm throwing it, it's actually putting a spin on the ball. A vertical spin can cause the ball to climb, and a horizontal spin will cause it to go off to the side. Now, we've seen this behavior previously in our coffee cup flyers. Two, three, go! <laughs> Now this is an easy demonstration, but it does take a little practice getting that rubber band just right. And if you get it right, it does a nice curve upwards and then slowly works its way down. I think this piece is even easier. All it takes is a flick of the wrist and you get a curveball every time. Good curve. Now I actually have a few different variations here, plus different types of balls to use. So let's take a look at some of them. To start here are my two favorite pieces, they're simply wooden handles with extensions to cradle the ball. I've had this one quite a while, I made it in 1990. It's a simple design with the extension screwed into the side of the handle. The paddle area has sand glued to it to give it better friction against the ball's surface. Up next I have two that were made out of carpet tubing. I added a handle to it and made it long enough that you could use it with two hands. Like that or just like that? Yes, like that. <coughs> yeah, I'm up. This piece was made out of a mailing tube. It has sand on the inside to give it texture. And the extra piece is glued to the back to give it more support. Here's one that was made out of a fluorescent light tube protector. The rough surface in this case is the tape running down the inside of the tube. This next piece was the tube from paper towels. Another piece was added inside as the ball stop. This one works great with ping pong balls. To show a contrast in movement, I also like to bring along my slingshot. For projectiles, I use a variety of different balls depending on how far I want it to go. These lightweight foam balls with a rough surface travel a shorter distance but have a lot of curve. The slightly heavier foam balls have a smooth surface, travel further, but don't curve quite as much. Hollow plastic balls such as golf balls work well. Another good option are ping pong balls. Putting holes in it will make it curve more. Now with the lighter foam balls and the ping pong balls, you can actually do this demonstration inside. Come on. Eh, we'll give it a throw, let's see what happens. It's a good one. Nice toss. Okay, get ready. Olivia, you're allowed to use your hands. It's not soccer. Hey, good toss, Savannah. This behavior we're seeing is actually the result of something called the Magnus effect. Now, this was first described in 1852 by Heinrich Magnus. He described the behavior of spinning objects as they travel through a fluid. In this case, the initial behavior is the ball's traveling forward. As it does so, it's also spinning. The rough surface causes air to be pushed and bend around the trailing side of the ball. This could be an example of Newton's third law as an action force. The reaction is the Magnus force applied in the opposite direction, and that's causing the ball to move away from that straight path. We can find quite a few examples of the Magnus effect. It can be as simple as a paper cylinder rolling down a ramp. You'll notice that it came back towards me.
Now, if I spin it in the other direction, what do you think will happen? Now, let's see. It goes away from me. If I simply drop it, it falls straight down. Throwing a curve in baseball, hitting a slice with a golf ball, a spinning tennis ball will curve, as will a volleyball if you give it a sideways spin. Now we do see the same effect whether the object is spinning and moving forward traveling through stationary air, or whether the object is stationary and moving air hits it. This is an example of a Flettner rotor. Blowing air across the spinning ball causes it to move. Or it could be a spinning bottle. The Magnus effect only applies to spinning objects. In the thrown objects, the direction of the spin nice, determines which way it curves. Throw. Now my slingshot, on the other hand, should give us a different trajectory simply because the ball is not going to be spinning, or at least it's going to be spinning at a much slower rate. In comparing their trajectories, let's first take a look at the flight path of the ball with the spin. The curve is actually most pronounced in the last quarter of its flight. Now let's take a look at the same type of ball shot with the slingshot. Its flight path resembles a parabola. The difference in the paths is due to the ball with the backspin creates lift. A ball that's spinning sideways, the curvature is even more pronounced. When my students would investigate the Magnus effect, I'd have them list as many variables as they could think of, and then we would create experiments to see which one had the greatest effect. Oh, that was good. That was good, bud. Once you can see, this is an easy and fun demonstration, and hopefully it's one you'll try for yourselves. Uh, in a future video, I'll show how to make a paddle either out of wood, or cardboard, or even out of poster board. So I hope you'll stay tuned. As always, thanks for watching and come back and see me again. Okay, bye.